Okay, it seems we don't get a signal from this laptop here. So I guess we just do it from over there. <laughs> Refuse to cooperate. So can we get this signal now? <laughs> yes, okay, thanks. So, five years and 13 days ago, this directive was adopted by the European Parliament. On 14th December 2005, the European Parliament, with a majority, voted in favor of the data retention directive. After a long, long, couple of years long battle, actually. And then it was later, in 2006, it was adopted by the Council, by the member states of the European Union, and then went into the force after publication in this official journal. So, five years and 13 days ago. And that, among other things, led to this lecture here, to this keynote, um, exactly five years ago, day one, same evening, <laughs> this hall here, um, by Frank and Rob, uh, who said, we lost the war against surveillance. Um, Rob also referred to this uh, this morning again. Um, so some people, including these guys, said, um, okay, now we have data retention, um, and this is the, the opening of the floodgates, now we are lost. Let's get some crypto and hide in some, um, I don't know, underground networks and wait for better times. But some, some other people also start to get organized. This here is actually the very first beginnings of the AK Vorratsdatenspeicherung, the German Working Group on Data Retention. It was when Heise reported on the adoption of the Data Retention Directive um, on the 14th of December in the Parliament. In the forum, um, Twister um, asked people to not just, you know, what they normally do in, in the Heise Forum, just uh, shout and jump up and down and get a red face and bang their heads against the wall and stuff like that. Um, but instead, maybe get organized and get together and actually do something. And then that actually worked. Some people really got together and, and joined a mailing list and somebody had a wiki and so on. And then two weeks later, also almost exactly five years ago, we had a small meeting here at the Congress, the first face-to-face -face meeting of Aka Forat with about 15 people. Um, yeah, and from there on, it just grew. <laughs> so um, I guess most of you have been at this demonstrations, at least at one of them couple of 10,000 people each year. Um, who knows this number here? Uh, a few, okay, not so many. Um, okay, different question. Who has participated in the constitutional court case in Germany? Okay, some more, because this is the number of actual participants in the court case, actual plaintiffs. And as you all know, on 2nd of March this year, the German Constitutional Court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, killed the German data retention law. It's dead now. Don't forget that. <clears throat> and yeah, I think this is, this is also um, a good um, moment to, to really thank everybody who was involved in, in our campaign against data retention. People who, who joined the AK Forat and helped with lots of time and, and writing press releases and talking to people and setting up local chapters and maintaining the wiki and the mail server and the mailing list server and uh, people who just donated money if they didn't have time, people who supported the constitutional court case, our lawyers, um, just everybody a big thank you. <laughs> Sebastian just <laughs> said, you're, you're my jubel perser. <laughs> Don't ruin the moment, sucker. <laughs> okay, anyhow, so we, we had a, quite a big success in Germany. There are some issues with the German court decision, which um, our legal experts will tell you in a moment. But um, at the moment, the German data retention law is non-existent. Data retention does not exist in Germany at the moment, and that's what we wanted. Great. 
But we are here now to tell you that we even need a much bigger fight. We need this whole fight and we need to win it on the European level. And we need, want to tell you why and what the state of affairs is in Europe. Because as I said, the whole thing came from Europe, so we have to kill it in Europe. Um, yeah, maybe a short history lesson. Um, if you um, haven't been around at that time, early 2000s, um, uh, the data retention debate already started in the, in the late 90s already. Law enforcement agencies actually in the United States um, asked for that measure. Um, they never got it in the United States, they never got it in Canada, but um, after 9-11, George W. Bush um, wrote a letter to the then president of the European Union, um, Romano Prodi, um, and asked to implement data retention in Europe, among other things. Just basically a week, no, a month after 9-11. It, it took a while because the European Parliament was really not convinced, there was also some battles in the council among the member states and so on. But then in 2005, two very unfortunate things happened at the same time. Um, we had the big um, bombing attacks, terrorist attacks in London. And at the same time, the British government took over the EU council presidency. So they were in charge of setting the agendas for the council of ministers meetings and so on. And then actually um, Tony Blair and his home affairs minister pushed the data retention directive through the council and the parliament extremely quickly. Um, the, the first official draft from the commission, from the European Commission for this directive came on the 21st of September 2005 and the first and last reading in the European Parliament was on 14th December, less than three months. I think it's the fastest legislative process in the history of the European Union. And as you all know, speed normally does not automatically lead to quality. So why don't we like it and what, what actually does the directive say? What it actually does is turn the idea of a free society on its head. In a normal free society, people can do what they want, talk to whom they want, um, go where they want without being monitored and recorded. They just can do it if there's no initial suspicion for police agencies or anybody else to, to monitor them, then they can expect to not be monitored. And they can also expect to not have to identify themselves all the time. You know, I can go to a bar, order a beer, go uh, shopping in the supermarket, whatever, meet people anywhere without having to tell who I am, you know. And the same should apply for telecommunications, of course. But what the directive does is turning this around and saying, okay, just because we can do it now, because it's an electronic data form, we just record for everybody with whom he or she is communicating and when and for how long and where. Just because some people might become suspects in the future. So you create 500 million suspects in Europe. And if you look at, um, I think it was from Denmark, a report um, where they um, calculated how many times you actually get recorded under the data retention law. Um, it's actually two, 225 times per day, every six minutes. Some telecommunications provider is recording that you make a phone call, where you make a phone call if you call from a mobile phone, when you get online, which IP address you get assigned, when you go offline again, when you send an email, when you receive an email, um, when you receive a phone call also, um, every six minutes for 500 million people in Europe. And the directive makes this mandatory. The member states have to implement national laws that say telecommunication providers, ISPs, have to record this data for everybody. And then some people say, okay, it's just traffic data, you know, um, they don't record the content of your emails or of your phone conversations. But actually, traffic data can reveal a hell of a lot about you. There's a study from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that showed 
Traffic data can allow to reveal who your colleagues are, your, your acquaintances and friends in 90% of the cases. Okay, that's more or less easy. You just look at your contact book in your phone or recent calls, whatever. But it also can tell you if you will meet a person in the next 12 hours for 90% of the cases. And if you have traffic data just from the last months, it allows you to predict where you will be in the next 12 hours in 95% of the cases. And it also allows a prediction of your general activities within the next 12 hours in 80% of the cases. So that's quite a lot. It reveals a lot about you. And this affects not just your right to privacy and data protection, or how we call it in Germany, informational self-determination. It also affects other rights. It affects your right to freedom of information. If you know you're being monitored all the time, your IP address is recorded and so on, you might not go to some suspicious websites to um, inform yourself about, I don't know, um, facts about uh, Islamic terrorism or whatever, because you might fear that you know, this lead, may lead to a suspicion or something. It also, related to that, um, affects your, your freedom of, uh, right to freedom of expression. You may not uh, as freely um, comment in a blog, for example, or discuss with others online, um, exchange emails and so on, if you know that your IP address and everything is recorded all the time. And this also affects your freedom of assembly. Nowadays, a lot of people organize and, and get together online, like we did with AK Vorrat. Um, this, of course, um, may not happen if people know they are being monitored all the time. We actually had a couple of cases in the constitutional court case in Germany where people said, I support your case here fully and totally and I'm willing to donate money and so on, but I won't become a plaintiff myself because I'm afraid that I end up in some blacklist in the government. It actually happens. And then, of course, related to the freedom of assembly, it's also, um, this affects the freedom of organization which uh, relates to trade unions. They have their special constitutional rights to, to organize among themselves. And this is also might be, be more difficult if people know they are being monitored all the time, if this happens online. Oh, I'm not loud enough? Okay, sorry. So this whole idea... Um, ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. So this whole idea of data retention basically kills the, the general presumption of innocence. It kills the idea that people can talk to other people and, and do things in a free society without having to identify themselves all the time. It basically kills the idea of a free society where people can do what they want without being monitored and, and so pervade all the time. And of course, it's, it's a big risk of an opening of the floodgates. If we accept the principle of mandatory data retention for everybody without an initial suspicion for telecommunications data, then, of course, we don't have much to say against retention of passenger data, of banking data, of all kinds of other data. So we end up, may end up in a society where, where all our activities, not just telecommunication activities, are being retained. And this is why um, Peter Hustings, the European Data Protection Supervisor, actually said just um, a few weeks ago that data retention, this directive, is the most privacy-invasive instrument ever adopted by the European Union. Think about this. We have all kinds of other privacy-invasive measures. We have the swift bank data transferred to the United States. We have passenger name records, uh, collection and analysis. We have all kinds of European investigation orders and uh, Europol and uh, databases of fingerprints for asylum seekers and, 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 and. But this data retention is the most privacy invasive instrument because it affects everybody. Okay, and with this I turn over to Axel. Right. Yeah, thank you, Ralph. Um, perhaps a good idea to... Okay, I'll tell, you, um, I'll tell you a bit about, uh, there's been a lot of uh, action since 2005, also in constitutional courts. Uh, we already mentioned the German, uh, being in Germany, uh, and uh, so many of you being part of this case. I only want to stress two points here. Um, uh, the Bundesverfassungsgericht uh, ruled that access 
is only allowed to this data in detailed circumstances prescribed by specific law. So that means that you not can use your, your everyday penal code, your moustache twirlingly evil um, uh, access schemes uh, for this, but you need detailed and, and specific uh, law for this because it is so invasive. And the second point is very important. It's about the cumulative effect. So if you allow, uh, if you allow um, uh, telecommunications data retention, the constitutional barrier is nearly overstepped. So banking, traveling, passenger name record, automatic number plates, recognition, you name it, um, it will be very hard uh, to allow that. Uh, but it didn't say anything about the principle of data retention. Well, the Romanian constitutional court in the meantime did. The Romanian Constitutional Court said that the principle of data retention is in breach of Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights, which guarantees privacy and, and secrecy of communications. <laughs> and this is a very big decision because uh, it ruled that the continuous limitation of privacy, because you're continuously monitored, makes the essence of the right disappear. It basically says, well, we can throw the European Convention on Human Rights uh, in, in, the, in the toilet uh, when we allow data retention. And a very important aspect of its ruling was the passive subject in communications. Uh, we're all techies here, so I don't have to explain you that when you call someone, your data as well is logged. But you can never know if the one person you have called or emailed is suspected of something. So by just emailing or calling someone, you can be a suspect in a criminal, uh, in a, in a criminal uh, investigation without your knowledge. It ruled that taking surveillance measures without adequate and sufficient safeguards can lead to destroying democracy on the ground of defending it. And I think that deserves a round of applause for these court. <laughs> As Rob said this morning, uh, increasingly we see judges being the, the saviors of our freedoms. In, in Hungary, there is a constitutional court case pending, and as well in Ireland. And this is very interesting because uh, an EDRI, a European Digital Rights member, Digital Rights Ireland, uh, got the Irish High Court to refer to the European Court of Justice. So in due course, we will see a ruling on the principle of data retention and on the directive which will have uh, a legal force in all the member states. So in, in due course, taking into account the previous rulings, we expect uh, this to have a very positive outcome. So uh, here's some, th some general principles in EU case law that, that the European Court of Justice will have to take into account. It will, of course, need to respect our privacy and secrecy of communication. And then, and this we, uh, Kasia will tell about this more, Surveillance must be strictly necessary, so not only useful. Okay, of course, it is useful to collect all the personal data of every citizen, but it has to be strictly necessary. And the more invasive, the higher the barrier. So um, data retention is, of course, affects all of us, so it has a very high barrier. Uh, the blanket data retention of biometric data was deemed illegal, irrespective of the retention period in 2009. And if there exists less less uh, restrictive alternatives to prosecute serious crime, then um, uh, surveillance is illegal. This was in a recent judgment by the ECJ in the Sheka case of only a couple of weeks ago. So these principles will have to apply to every aspect of surveillance, not only the retention, but also its access, its, uh, its uh, data security, further processing of data. So the threshold for allowing data retention for the European Court of Justice will be very high. Thank you. Over to me. Um, I will try to tell you a bit about uh, the evaluation of the directive which happens in the European Commission. Uh, it's nothing strange that this directive comes under review. This is what happens with every single directive after some time of its, of its existence. But in this particular case, due to all these controversies that Ralph described, it was decided in the very text of the directive that it will come under revision so soon, even before it's been implemented in all member states. So we have that process now. Its first stage is evaluation, which basically means that the Commission has to look at what has been achieved by that legal act so far and whether it should be left as it is, whether it should be amended or maybe repealed. 
the basic question we have to ask here is whether it serves the purpose is what it, it was supposed to serve. The purpose, as, as we made clear, was, uh, I mean, the directive was supposed to be necessary, strictly necessary instrument to fight serious crime. This is what should be tested in the review process by the Commission. In order to answer that fundamental question, the Commission asked member states to provide data, the data on how data retention was used, by whom, with what effect. The idea was, they hoped for, that the member states would provide them evidence, hard evidence, that without that particular instrument, law enforcement agencies can simply not do their job at all. So what is the landscape of data retention when we are halfway through the evaluation process? We have already said that it looks like a patchwork in a legal sense because some member states have not implemented this instrument at all. Some are already fighting it. But I would say that looking at the data from countries where it was implemented, we see it's even worse. It's much more dramatic. The purpose of the directive was to harmonize data retention rules. And one commission official we spoke to in private said that not a single member state has implemented the directive in accordance with the underlying thought, which means simply that the harmonization failed. <laughs> Clearly, there is not a single aspect that was implemented precisely in the same way across the EU. Let's look at all these major aspects time, T p retention periods, they vary as much as they can, from six months to two years for all sorts of data, including your internet logs, including information on missed calls, because this is also being stored. Uh, second aspect, storage, what is being stored? It differs in particular with, um, with reference to internet. Internet was not the major idea behind data retention. It was designed for mobile phones, but they added internet just in case it can be useful without really realizing what internet means at the time. So we have huge problems now in defining when the internet starts and what should be stored. It differs really across what the operators can do across the EU, not even the member states. Purpose an extremely important um, idea that was not really harmonized. It was set fighting serious crime. As you can imagine, every member state can interpret serious crime as they like or as it fits their local or global politics. For example, Poland thought it would be good to have retention for general crime prevention, including also uh, proving stuff in civil court cases. In the Netherlands, your traffic data can be used not only if you are a suspect, but also if you are familiar with the suspect, which opens totally to the whole uh, society. Finally, a key dimension we underline is access. Who can access this data, when and for, for, for what reason? That was left to the discretion of member states or, if you like, their secret services. So we see all sorts of solutions, from strict judicial control, like in Italy, congratulations, uh, through some form of internal supervision, like in the UK, through lack of any external audit, like in Poland. Uh, well, so what is the state of affairs in the Commission after having that evaluation started? <laughs> Not surprisingly, uh, they stumble a bit and they face incredible difficulty in producing the report. Uh, the report, as you probably heard, uh, because it was said um, in the um, introduction to this talk in our program, was supposed to be published before our conference in September. It's not going to be published by March. Uh, why? Why is it so? Uh, well, the official reason was that member states refused to provide data for the Commission, which is partly true because uh, some of them did not provide anything, some of them provided hilarious data. It's recommended reading if someone has time because it really shows lack of respect for the Commission in itself. Uh, but it's only half true. They did provide some data, only it turned out that the Commission asked the wrong question. Uh, as we said in our test, they should have asked about the data that proves beyond doubt that this instrument is necessary to fight serious crime and proportionate. What they discovered was mostly how it was implemented and whether it was useful for the secret services. It's easy to guess that it was useful. 
So, what we see is that the emperor has no clothes. There is clearly no statistical data proving that data retention, the blanket data retention, is a necessary instrument to fight serious crime. Not a single member state provided this proof, this evidence, and it's not going to be provided for the Commission until, until March. Why the key commissioner responsible for the dossier, Cecilia Malmstrom, is refusing to say that she will repeal the directive? Well, it, it's for political reasons, of course. She fears the council most, which means she fears other governments. It's not surprising that the member states that already implemented that instrument and are benefiting from incredible surveillance possibilities are not willing to give that back. We are more concerned with why the commissioner is defending the government, not the citizens of the European Union. One of her uh, well, members of the political cabinet said it in a more straightforward way. We simply cannot take the toys from the boys. Talking about intelligence services and law enforcement agencies. Even, well, what was our su surprise for us is that things are getting even worse. There was a crucial conference organized in Brussels in December, evaluation conference. Uh, this, is, this is the slide about this conference, on which um, the commissioner had a talk, and in that talk she said openly that data retention is here to stay. She said that halfway through the evaluation process, which means she actually announced the outcome of the process, before it was even concluded. That undermines the whole, the whole idea of evaluating and inviting civil society to talk about, about the directive, which is more crucial for us. It also, it's also a caricature of evidence-based policy making, because all evidence here is against the Commission. And Patrick will now tell you more about this evidence. <clears throat> Yes, all of the speakers have uh, talked about the question of necessity of data retention and I will try to give you some figures from our perspective and our point of view on whether this measure is actually necessary and needed to uh, prosecute crime. We do not think so. The first argument that is often advanced is, well, what Mrs. Malmström said, there is an average of 148,000 requests per year in each member state if the data weren't helpful, the law enforcement authorities would presumably not request them in this number. Second argument was that data freeze will never bring back deleted data. So this argument goes along the line, if you have more data, this is useful to us. Is that actually true? Um, I don't think so, because firstly, some traffic data is available even without data retention. Quite clearly, you have billing data, you have data from targeted telecommunications surveillance measures, and you have data of on live connections. While a person is online, you can identify their IP address. Secondly, access to data is no indication of whether the information has actually any influence on the outcome of an investigation procedure. A German study found that 72% of criminal investigation procedures in Germany with fully successful requests for traffic data still didn't result in an indictment of any person. Meaning that even if you have more data, often it doesn't actually make a difference to the outcome of the investigation. Another argument that is often uh, put forward is uh, we can provide lots of statistics and examples of how retained data is used to prosecute crime, to protect victims, to clear innocent persons of suspicion. Well, even where it is established that retained data has had an influence on the outcome of an investigation procedure, and that's not the case very often as I explained earlier, nothing is said about whether data preservation, a targeted regime, wouldn't have achieved the same or even better results. And that question isn't even examined by the Commission. According to a, a German study, one third of the crimes that could not be investigated using traffic data was still cleared in another way. For example, using targeted trap and trace measures or tracing payment data where fraud is involved. Also, all in all, blanket data retention only actually makes a difference to 0.002% of criminal investigations at most 
meaning that those cases that suffer from a lack of traffic data is a very small, tiny percentage of all investigation procedures at all. And then you need to look into the counterproductive effects of data retention and set those off any benefits it may have. Data retention can actually be ineffective due to its counterproductive effects by making people use circumvention techniques such as anonymization services, unregistered prepaid cards, etc. In 2009, when data retention was in force in Germany, in a poll, 12% of German internet users said that they already use an anonymization service to connect to the internet, and 33% more said that they intend to use such a service. Now, if data retention makes people use such circumvention techniques, then you can't actually trace criminals even where there is a specific suspicion because if they use a, a foreign um, anonymization service, for example, in India or, or, or China, uh, people wouldn't be able to trace them even in the case of a, a suspicion. So data retention can actually be counterproductive by making people use these um, uh, circumvention techniques. The third argument that is advanced very often in Germany at the moment is uh, we can provide lots of examples of unsolved crime and people say this is due to a lack of traffic data. Well, we'd counter this argument quite easily by saying that extra information is no indication of whether the information would have had any influence on the outcome of the investigation procedure and also even if it is useful in this case or the other, data retention can be ineffective overall because it makes the investigation of other crimes impossible due to those counterproductive effects I've talked about. And taking all of those factors into account, let's look at some statistics that will show whether or not there is an influence of data retention on crime and crime clearance. This is actually official police statistics uh, where this data comes from. Looking at how Germany fared with data retention that came into effect in 2008, you will find that the registered number of criminal acts has been declining for years and that data retention when coming into effect in 2008 hasn't had any uh, effect on that development. Um, internet crime has been rising because internet is being used more and more and data retention coming into effect for internet in 2009 hasn't had any has made any difference to that development either. Regarding the crime clearance rate, meaning what percentage of crime was actually cleared, you will find that it has been constant, uh, the total cl crime clearance rate here in green, and regarding internet crime in particular, uh, the clearance rate has actually dropped after data retention came into effect, meaning that a smaller proportion is being cleared with data retention in place. This is not just a, a German development. In the Czech Republic, the number of registered crime didn't change much after data retention came into effect in 2005. You can see it stayed about the same. And the crime clearance rate also stayed about the same, around 37, 38, 39%, um, whether or not data was being retained. And looking at a state where data retention has never been in effect, Austria, you will find exactly the same picture. The number of registered crime is declining slightly or staying about the same without data retention. And the number of crime that was cleared is also staying the same without data retention. Meaning that data retention where it has come into effect hasn't actually had any statistically significant impact on crime or crime clearance. Governments around the world such as Austria, Germany, Greece, Greece Romania, Sweden, Canada are prosecuting crime without data retention just as successfully as other governments that are using data retention. In none of these states has the absence of data retention led to a rise in crime or to a decrease in clearance rate, nor did the coming into force of data retention have any statistically significant effect. So everything the Commission says contrary to, to this statement is not backed up with um, actual data. On the one hand, we have the fact that data retention does not have any benefits. On the other hand, it has quite detrimental side effects that we would like to um, go into more detail now um, into some cases of abuse. In Germany, one case is quite well known and that is the T-Mobile case. Uh, actually, staff member of T-Mobile sold data 
um, to the black market. Um, about 17 million subscribers to T-Mobile and suddenly um, the data of prominent politicians or people um, who have a very strong interest in their home address being private was available to criminals and the Federal Crime Agency had to take measures to protect them. That is one example. Kaja will give you another. Uh, very briefly in Poland again, uh, only this year we had an incredible example of abuse of data retention talking about journalists. The media discovered that four influential journalists were being surveilled for a long time, including their billing data being retrieved from even two years ago in order to trace back their journalistic sources. Obviously, the sources started panicking, and we have now a big affair and, and side effect of, of that affair in, in, in the form of, I mean, having impact on, on the quality of, of journalism in Poland. But uh, it's not funny at all. It's just showing how dramatically this tool can go against the very principles of democratic state, which is freedom of expression. Yeah, and a Dutch um, uh, abuse case um, is tragic comically uh, as well. Uh, a journalist and a security expert exposed uh, serious security leaks in the email account of our state secretary of defense, Jack de Vries, for the Dutch people out there, Jack had leg. And um, uh, uh, what happened was that uh, the authorities were not giving him a medal or applauding him for not misusing the data and for uh, signaling the state secretary for, hey man, your email account is open in the white. Um, no, they prosecuted him. Uh, of course, uh, requesting all his telecommunications data of the last year, revealing all his sources, but as well, and Kasia already said that in the Netherlands, um, telecommunications data can be requested not when you're a suspect, but also when you're familiar with one. Uh, this security expert, his name was Jeroen, which is a familiar name in the Netherlands, and it turned out in the court case that of this journalist, uh, the uh, law enforcement agencies had requested the telecommunications data of all the Jeroens he knew for one year. So if you happen to, uh, you know, if your name happens to be Jeroen and you call this journalist, your telecommunications data is out in the open. And that is where we come to the Romanian court case. You know, you are a third person, you just want uh, your story in the news or you, uh, a journalist calls you, your name is Jeroen, and suddenly your telecommunications data record of one year is out in the open. Another uh, short uh, uh, function creep is upon us, people. Uh, don't, don't, don't get me wrong here. Already pending at the European uh, Court of Justice and also a party at the German Bundesverfassungsgericht was the content industry. The content industry is, of course, very happy and very interested in getting this data uh, to, uh, well, whatever reason they might have for it. So function creep is upon us, and uh, don't uh, judge this mildly for file sharing, torrent downloading, whatever you want to do. Uh, in the future, your telecommunications data might get in, uh, in the wrong hands. Okay, so to sum up, um, I think we have, um, at least we have tried to show you that um, there's a big, big problem with, with the fundamental principle of data retention. There's um, big problems with, with all the evidence from member states. Um, the commission is in deep trouble with the evaluation report. Um, and that is why we need you to fight this fight together with us. What's, what's the situation in Brussels at the moment? Um, as we said, the, the commissioner Malmström already announced that she thinks data retention is here to stay, which is interesting because she never said she likes data retention or she is in favor of it or she thinks it's a good idea. She just said, I think it is here to stay. Because when she was still a member of the European Parliament in 2005 for the Liberal Group, she voted against it. At the moment, she's just afraid of the majority of member states in the Council who don't want to get rid of this measure. Um, anyhow, the uh, Commission, what they do in about half a year from now, they will present 
proposal for revising the data retention directive. And this proposal can, can include anything. It can say, okay, we need longer retention periods or shorter or maybe shorter for internet data and longer for telephone, whatever. And could also say we extend the scope to search engines or to other services. Uh, but of course it could also say we repeal data retention or we even ban it across Europe. That's up to the commission. What um, the commission cannot do, that's the specific, specificities of European lawmaking, the commission cannot make the final decision about it. The commission just presents a proposal and then the actual decision has to be taken by the council, that is the member states, and by the European parliament. So what's the situation in council? Very briefly, we already mentioned it. Um, there are at the moment a majority of member states who have data retention in their national laws and their law enforcement agencies really love that and they don't want to get rid of it. They don't want to give away their toys. But we also have a, at least a significant minority of member states who are either still politically against data retention, like Austria for example, or where their constitutional courts have told them that they have to be against it because it's just unconstitutional. And of course, um, we need to get a majority for this position. And that means it's not enough if we just have a big major campaign against data retention in Germany and maybe do something in Brussels. That means we need all of you who are not from Germany to start campaigns against data retention in all 27 EU member states. We need anti-data retention campaigns, privacy campaigns in Greece, in Portugal, in the Slovak Republic, in Hungary, in Finland, in any of the other countries also. In the Parliament, it's, um, it might be a bit easier. The, the members of the European Parliament, at least since the adoption of the Lisbon Treaty last year, uh, which gave the Parliament more powers, also in, in the area of law enforcement and domestic security, um, the members of Parliament in a way enjoy the idea <coughs> or the public perception of being the defenders of uh, European civ civil liberties. Um, some of you have probably noticed the veto against the SWIFT bank transfer data, uh, d data transfer to the US in February. Um, there's still a video recording from that vote in the Strasbourg session uh, on the Parliament's website. It's, it's really interesting because you can really see how, how these uh, parliamentarians love their role as, as um, fighting for the rights of EU citizens. Um, the problem with the, with the Parliament is that uh, in 2005, the Social Democrats, which is the big red group here, um, voted in favor of data retention. And they still have the same chairman, Martin Schulz, a guy from Germany, from the SPD. Um, the background is that <clears throat> in 2005, we had a, a grand coalition in Germany, which just had started a bit before between the Social Democrats and the Conservatives. And suddenly, the German Social Democrats were in favor of data retention. Now, they are moving again to, towards our position, in a way. They are still not really decided, but uh, with some lobbying and some campaigning, it should be possible to convince a majority of the European Parliament that data retention is nothing we want. But as I said, in the end, we also need a majority of the member states. So go home and do your job there. <laughs> yeah, we will certainly... We will certainly do, uh, continue to do so in Europe. Um, all of us uh, and a lot of other organizations are uh, a member of European Digital Rights, EDRI, which is the umbrella organization of 29 uh, digital rights organizations in Europe <clears throat> from 19 member states. And we will uh, be happy to do all the lobbying for you. <laughs> we will be happy to do all the campaigning, to, to file court cases, to do everything, but we can't do it without you. Um, and we realized we need a broader coalition. So now we are together with 106 NGOs, <coughs> ranging from uh, doctors to lawyers to the European Federation of Journalists, uh, uh, digital rights organizations from all over Europe, uh, 106 organizations writing to the European Commission stop this uh, really bad uh, measure. Um, that had some effect. But not only Brussels counts, as we said, and, but it's never enough to say, we really need local campaigns in all member states. We have started doing something in, in Germany with Akavorad, <laughs> many of you, I hope, 
in, in the Netherlands with Bits of Freedom, in Poland with Panopticon, but we really need more member states, not just for doing anything, but for one precise thing for sure. We need to stretch a bit and produce counter reports, shadow reports to what the Commission is preparing for the 5th of March. We need to prove that the data retention is not a necessary instrument to fighting crime in Europe. And we need our own conclusions to be transferred to the public, to the media, to the politicians. Therefore, we would like to gather some data from, from, from all member states, possibly. And with maybe your help, if you would like to join, process them in the way that is visually compelling and can be, can be really trans transferred to people that might not be interested in the details, but can see the idea and can see why data retention is wrong. So please help us. At the moment, the voice, our voice, and the voice of the critics is only one among many other voices of many member states, law enforcement agencies, police agencies who want data retention. So what we need to do is um, to join in the community and to um, let our voice be heard as large as it actually is, because those 106 organizations that Axel told you about represent a much larger share of the population than all of the proponents could. So what you can do if you don't want to, to join any organization is, um, for example, you can write to newspapers that report about data retention, write a letter to any journali journalist that supports data retention, or to any politician that is reported to support data retention and explain them why they are wrong, um, ask the media to interview critics to let our voice be heard in the public perception. Um, you can um, invite somebody from our organization to talk about data retention at school, at your university, at a party or a meeting. Um, in Germany we have the network called Freiheitsredner who are happy to discuss and explain these issues to anyone for free. Or else you could donate and support our campaign in this way. So there's lots you can do and we invite you to join in. So, in conclusion, um, the subtitle was why the time is now to get involved. Well, we told you, we don't like data retention. You don't like data retention. The current situation is an outright mess. We have the constitutional courts on our side. We have the facts on our side. And data retention is now clear after its inception, seriously harms the private life of 500 million Europeans. Why the time is now? It's just the first review after the inception. This is the last moment to attack the core principle of blanket data retention. Any other review will be about you know, this certain detail or that, that detail. This is the moment to attack the core principle. So we, now we need political momentum. We need to build a strong European movement against this blanket data retention that affects us all. So please, everybody, get involved. This is absolutely critical now if we want not only to end this for the time being in Germany, but to make it uh, history forever. And 2011 will be the decisive year to do so, <clears throat> to end this uh, moustache twirlingly evil uh, retention of, uh, of all our telecommunications behavior. So we thank you all for listening, and we couldn't, we, we couldn't ever think of all the things you can do. So tomorrow, 8 o'clock in room B04 at day 2 of the conference, there's a workshop. Come there, know how you can get involved. Uh, we are open to all your critique, uh, we are open to all your uh, suggestions, to all your enthusiasm, and for now we are open to all your questions. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, can you provide a URL or something uh, with material we could use in addressing our uh, newspapers or, <coughs> or politicians or whoever? So material like you have presented here that we could uh, use as ammunition in our uh, battle? Are you doing it right now? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, most certainly. Uh, come tomorrow or visit, visit edri.org 
or the website of any of our organization, uh, get in touch with us and we'll be very happy to do so. Uh, Probably Edry because it's in English, so it's more easy to use uh, www.edry.org. Yeah, and of course the slides of this presentation will be online at the website. <laughs> there's, there's also a big collection of data in the, um, on the website and in the wiki of AK Forat, and a lot of the material also is available in English. <laughs> I see. <laughs> I want to uh, enhance the question of my previous, uh, previous questionnaire. Uh, a couple of years ago with the European uh, software patent law, there were also uh, verbatim letters you could use to send off to your local politicians. That would be very handy because I don't have the time to write long letters in the legal speak. So if you could provide those letters in many different languages, or maybe, maybe have volunteers to yeah. translate the standard uh, letters to, to their countries, uh, language that would be very helpful. I think you just volunteered for the workshop tomorrow. <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> no In the Netherlands, by the way, we're working at a website, uh, Dichter bij Den Haag. Um, we're working on a tool which makes exactly this very easy, where you just have three interfaces. Um, you have the letter, you have the contact details, and then you can send it. And uh, because um, we want to export, we made the court of co code, of course, uh, we'll make it open so we can export this to all the other member states as well. Plus, we can always use the, what La Quadrature du Net does, right? We have uh, basically addresses of all the MEPs there. So we keep reusing their source, their, their, their resource for, for our sending our stuff. But that's definitely which language would be useful? Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. So, it's covered. Yeah, I think I think we're already covered in, in German, Polish, and Dutch. But we need Finnish and Greek and Slovenian and Spanish and all the other languages also. Yeah, and Luxembourg. We need your help for that. Yeah, Luxembourg. If there's someone from Luxembourg, that would be very important. Yeah. Okay. See you tomorrow. <laughs> no more questions. I've got uh, two questions from IRC. The first one is, uh, does the panel think that the European Data, European Data Protection Commissioner's Article 29 uh, workgroup can give a good counterbalance in the revision process of the Data Retention Directive? What, what's your question? That the European institutions uh, have enough, the data protection institutions are powerful enough? Well, I'll, uh, re, uh, the I question is, do, do you think that the European Data Protection Commissioners, the Article 29 workgroup, uh, can give a good counterbalance in the revision process of the, state re uh, of the data retention directive? That's the, que that's the question. So, uh, There's something problem with, with, with uh, voice transmission. We almost can hear we, that. We couldn't really understand you, sorry. Walter, maybe could you try to... Yeah, the, the question whether the yeah. Article 29 work group has, has enough power to counter this. Article 29 group? Yes? Yes. yes. The question yes. Is well, I'm afraid not. I mean, they are not... Uh, they don't have any binding. They are very, very wise people to some extent in what they recommend, but they have no binding powers to... To, to cancel or kill or kill any legal instrument. They can only recommend things, but nothing more than that. For, for those of you who don't know, Article 29 working party is uh, the, basically the, the um, data protection authorities of all EU member states who work together because they are mentioned in Article 29 of the Data Protection Directive. Um, and they, of course, try to do their job. They try to protect our data protection uh, rules and our privacy. But they, of course, can only be as strong as the public opinion is. If they don't get any public support, they can do nothing. So they also rely on us and on you. They presented a report in summer about how the directive on data retention is not being properly applied and how there are serious uh, misapplications of it but it's not really critical about the principle of data retention, which apparently they couldn't agree on. 
because some data protection commissioners don't really want to reject it outright at this moment in time. And that, of course, is not very good for a campaign. We can rely on that. Okay. There was one more question on RSC. Um, if, data if data retention does not help to fight crime, why do law enforcement people want it? There is a problem with microphone. We can't really understand. Maybe. I'm, I'm afraid you have to repeat the question. Maybe talk. Oh. Okay, the question was, if it doesn't work, why do the law enforcement people want this? Well, that is a, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I, I have a small hypothesis on this. Um, it, 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 it does, of course, uh, law enforcement agencies have, uh, uh, can make use of it, but in a mu much more dark and secret way, intelligence services can, and their ways are, of course, very transparent. In, uh, the, in the Dutch law, um, you have uh, this Article 29 of the Law on Intelligence Services, that basically gives them the right to request any database um, uh, in the Netherlands and do da data, mining, data mining over that. So I think that a very important uh, proportion of data retention is actually about data mining for intelligence services. You've, you've got to imagine the police officer sitting at his desk and wanting to, to solve a crime. And of course they like more data. We, maybe this will help us, but the police officer cannot tell whether this measure will have counterproductive effects, whether all in all it will actually protect our security. That's not something that the police officer can know, and that is a matter of statistical and empirical analysis. So if you are short-sighted, you will look at the case at hand. If you are far-sighted, you will look at the entire measure and it, all of its effects, and that's what needs to be done. Yeah, and, and one important aspect which we, which we didn't really uh, discuss is the uh, automatic uh, national search engines that are built in quite rapid speed. For instance, in uh, Germany you have one, in, uh, in the Netherlands you have one as well, SEALT it's called, and uh, that uh, makes a sort of automatic uh, uh, Google search engine uh, for any police officer uh, just requesting, uh, typing in a name or a telephone number and all the data rolls out. Um, uh, that, of course, is very cheap, you know, uh, it, and it's very lazy. You can eat your donut, uh, put it in the, the Google search engine, and it will flop out. So uh, it, it's, it's useful, but if it's strictly necessary, that's, that's absolutely not the case. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. I have a question. What's to be done with data that's being retained by Google or by uh, Yahoo through their uh, search engines? whether they are covered by the directive? Yeah, I mean, uh, Google admitted this year they retain data through the Street View process, so uh, yeah. personal identifiable information from the users. I mean, how can we control that, and how, what power do we have on that data? Because, I mean, if you don't like it, you just don't use the system. You don't know what Google or uh, Microsoft is storing in their servers, so that data could be used later against you at some point. You know, like the Americans, they can make a subpoena to those companies and can get information from their servers. So what is the jurisdiction of, I don't know, European Union and what, do well, we, what can we do for that? Well, if you talk about Google and, and Yahoo, um, if they provide email services to you, they are covered by the data retention directive, so they have to retain your email data. No, but they are not. They are not. Right. Well, there, there is controversy, actually, about Okay, it depends on the, on the member state in that normally case. normally they shouldn't do um, Search engine data, search engine requests are not covered by the data retention directive. There was an uh, initiative by some weird lobby groups earlier this year in Brussels and Strasbourg to extend the scope of data retention to search engines. Um, whatever, a different story. But, um, of course, many of these search engines uh, sit in the United States where you don't have any data protection law for Internet uh, services, so they can retain what they want. And then it's a question of how to apply European data protection law to United States servers, but that's a diff different story. So also. summarizing, okay, what thank you do you. The time is up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See you all tomorrow.